I have introduced the Speaker of the Evening so many times on this occasion that I am sure that by this time he must know who he is. <laughs> and I assure him that we know who he is out of the gratitude that is in our hearts every Christmas time when he brings us this very fine present. And so tonight, I'm going to give him the only introduction proper to the occasion. This is one reserved for men in high places. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Delbert G. Lean, who will read for us the Christmas Carol written not by him, but by Charles Dickens. Well, my dear friends, after that uh, very interesting introduction, I can hardly wait to, to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, Dr. Lowry is rather an unusual fellow. For 10 years, now, he has been introducing me. And every year, it, uh, he has to use the same material, but every year it sounds a little different. There's quite a lot of change in it. Now it requires a considerable skill to introduce the same man year after year and yet say something that is, uh, well, interesting, let us say. I have been reading recently uh, one of the uh, autobiographies of Mark Twain. Uh, there are, he, most people are satisfied with one autobiography, but uh, Mark Twain has four now, and uh, there may be others coming for all I know. <laughs> I was struck by one thing, uh, one particular thing, and that was that Mark Twain said that he was blessed with a very uh, brilliant imagination, and he could remember a tremendous number, number of things, whether they happened or not. Well, now, that's in a way, that's uh, what uh, Mr. Lowry does. Uh, he, what he says, you know, is uh, brilliantly colored, always brilliantly colored and beautifully said. He's a genius, there's no question about that. <laughs> but I must get on with this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, work that I have ahead of me tonight. But I'm in no great hurry to start in. So my, I... I uh, I hesitate to do it because this is so pleasant to sit here and just chat with you. You know, I can't help but think that if the uh, spirit of uh, Charles Dickens was abroad tonight, well, which it might, might easily be, he'd be very, very pleased indeed to see that uh, the selection, A Christmas Carol, that he wrote 125 years ago, is still so popular with audiences. Well, this is the story as I have it. I, I had no notion years ago when I picked up this little book in a second-hand store in Boston that I was going to uh, uh, well, get into a predicament, something like this. <laughs> Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for whatever he chose to put his hand to. 
Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. <laughs> of course he did. How could it be otherwise? He and Marley had been partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole assign, his sole res residuary legatee, his sole friend, his sole mourner. No, nobody ever painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, scraping, grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence on him. No warmth could warm, no cold could chill him. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely. Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him on the street to say with gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When are you coming down to see us? No children ever asked him what it was o'clock. No beggars ever implored him to bestow a trifle. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into courts and up alleys and then wag their tails as though they said, no eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones called uh, nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather, and the city clocks had only just gone three, but was quite dark already. Now, Scrooge had a very small fire in his own room, but the fire of his clerk was so much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it. For so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Whereupon the clerk put on his comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who had come in upon him so suddenly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug? Why, you don't mean that, Uncle. I'm sure I do mean it. Out of unmerry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without any money? Time for balancing your books and finding every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I had my way, every idiot that goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart, he should. Uncle, nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. Well, there are many things from which I might have profited, from which I have not derived good. I dare say Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it has come around as a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time that I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by common consent to open their shut up hearts freely and think of people below them as if they were fellow travelers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. 
Let me hear another sound from you and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. <laughs> oh, come, Uncle. Don't be angry. Dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him in... Yes, indeed he did. <coughs> <laughs> he went the whole length of that expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, Uncle? Why? Why? Why did you get married? Well, because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Nay, Uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as an excuse for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so obdurate. We've never had a quarrel to which I have been a party, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. Now the Scrooge's and the, the, the clerk in letting Scrooge's nephew out had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen. Pleasant to behold, they stood in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers under their arm. Uh, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing uh, Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and needy who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common necessaries, sir. Are uh, there no... Uh, Prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons, but under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body for the unoffending multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor and needy some food and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time of all others because it is a time when abundance rejoices and want is keenly felt. Uh, what shall I uh, put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what's my wish, gentlemen, that's my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time. I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses and those who are badly off must go there. Well, many can't go there and many would rather die. Well, if they'd rather die, they'd better do it then and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> At length, the time for shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to his expectant clerk who snuffed out the candle and was off his stool in an instant. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. Well, if quite convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient. It's not fair. You'd think yourself mighty ill-used, I'll be bound, if I was to stop half a crown for it. Yes, sir. But you don't think me ill-used for paying a day's wages for no work. Well, it's only once a year, sir. Yeah, it's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th day of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Well... Be here all the earlier next morning. Clark promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his comforter dangling below his waistcoat, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his uh, melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. And having beguiled the evening and, uh, with his banker's book and read all the papers, went home to bed. 
He lived in quarters that had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy seat of rooms in the lowering pile of buildings up a yard. The rooms were old enough now and gloomy enough, for nobody lived in them but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker of this house, excepting that it was very large. Also that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his entire sojourn in the place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called uh, fancy about him as any man in London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any immediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face with a dim light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not gloomy or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look with its ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it became a knocker again. Ah, I'm bad and he closed the door with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He closed the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly through, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button, for it's being very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it, but before he closed his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the sofa. A uh, little saucepan of gruel, Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hob. Nobody under the bed. Nobody in his closet. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room, as usual, old fire guard, old shoes, washing stand on three legs, and a Poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his shoes, put on his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. But as he threw his head back in his chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the chambers and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a room in the highest part of the building. It was with great awe and a strange inexplicable dread that as he looked he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly and so did every bell in the whole house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below as if some person were dragging heavy chains over the casks in the wine merchant cellar below. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floor below, then coming up the stairs, come, then coming straight toward his door. On it came, through the heavy doors, and a specter passed into the room before his eyes, and upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it said, I know him. Marley's ghost. The same face, the very same. Marley in his usual waistcoat, pigtail, tights and boots. His body was transparent. So that Scrooge observing him and looking through him could see the two buttons on his coat behind.
Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels. <laughs> but he had not believed it until now. Nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through and felt the chilling influence of his death-cold eyes and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief about his head and chin, he was still incredulous. Now, now, what do you want with me? Much. <laughs> Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Well, who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, uh, can you, uh, sit down? <laughs> I can. Do it then. <laughs> Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find itself in a condition to take a chair. And he felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? Well, I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Well, because a very slight thing affects them. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a rod of mustard, a fragment of an underdone potato, or a crumb of cheese. <laughs> More of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Now, Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The tr truth is, he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his horror. But how much greater was his horror when the ghost, taking off the bandage it wore around his head and chin, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, his lower jaw dropped down upon his breast. Mercy! Dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Why do ghosts walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad amongst its fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I would, a very little more is permitted me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. Mark me, in life my spirit never rode beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. You travel fast on the wings of the wind. Seven years dead and traveling all the time? You must have got over a great quantity of ground in seven, seven years, Jacob. Oh, blind man, blind man, not to know that ages of incessant toil by immortal creatures must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian character working kindly in its little sphere will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Yet I was once like this man. I once was like this man. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business, mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, tolerance were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the ghost going on so and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I, I will, but, but don't be hard upon me. 
Now, don't be flowery, Jacob Bay. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. Uh, thank you. You're always a good friend to me. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope that you mentioned, Jacob? Well, I think I'd rather not. Without their visit, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night when the clock strikes one, the second on the next night at the same hour, the third on the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, but look that for your own sake you remember well what has passed between us. It walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the apparition reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge closed the window, examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the exertion he had undergone, or the glimpse of the invisible world, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep on the instant. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent windows and the opaque walls of his room. When suddenly the church bells tolled a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room on the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure like a child, yet not so much like a child as like an old man viewed through some supernatural medium that gave it the appearance of having receded from view and being diminished to a child's proportion. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin, and the face had not a wrinkle in it. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction to this wintry emblem, how did had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from, crown, from it, the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light by which this was all visible, and which was doubtless the reason of its wearing in its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. The things that you will see with me are the shadows of the things that have been. They'll have no consciousness of us. What business brought you here? Your welfare. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to protest that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that the bed was warm, the thermometer a long way below freezing, that he was clad but thinly in his slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap, that he had a cold upon him at the time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made his way toward the window, clasped his robe in supplication. I am a mortal, liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the walls, and they stood in the busy thoroughfares of a great city upon a snowy Christmas Eve. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, and they stopped at a certain warehouse. And the ghost asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Why, wasn't I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig sitting behind such a tall desk that if he'd been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Old Scrooge cried out in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, 
It's all Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig looked, uh, laid down his uh, pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven, adjusted his capacious waistcoat and laughed all over himself and called out in a rich, fat, jovial, oily voice, To who there? Ebenezer, Dick. A living picture, Scrooge's former self came in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. My old fellow apprentice, to be sure, Dick Wilkins. He was very fond of me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. Christmas Eve, Dick, Christmas Ebenezer. No more work tonight, boys. Clear away my hearties and let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, there was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig look on, looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off out of sight as if it were dismissed from public life forever. The floor was swept and watered, fuel was heaped upon the fire, the lamps were trimmed and the warehouse was as snug and bright and dry and warm a ballroom as you would care to see upon a winter's night. In came the fiddler with the music box and went up to the desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. <laughs> In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the cook with her brother, brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In they all came, some shyly, some boldly, some awkwardly, some gracefully, some pushing, some pulling, but in they all came. Away they all went. Twenty couples at once, hands half round and back again, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping, old top couple turning up at the wrong place, new top couple starting off as soon as they got there, all top couples at last and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was reached, old Fezziwig clapping his hands to stop the dance cried out, well done, well done. And the fiddler plunged his face into a pot of porter, especially provided for the purpose. <laughs> and then there were more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and a great piece of cold roast, and a great piece of cold boiled and minced pies. But the great effect of the evening came after the cold roast and boiled, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Mrs. Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mr. Fezziwig. Top couple two with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pairs of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if it had been twice as many, four times as many, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the word. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. You couldn't have predicted at any given moment what would become of them next. And when they'd gone all through advance and retire, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to place, Fezziwig cut, and cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. When the clock struck 11, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their station on either side of the door, shook hands with every person individually as he or she went out, and when they'd all gone but the two apprentices, they did the same to them. And so the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. Small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude, he has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves all this praise? Well, it isn't that spirit, it isn't that. But he has the power to render us happy or unhappy. 
to make our service light or burdensome, a toil or a pleasure. Say that his power lies in words, in looks, in things so slight and insignificant that's impossible to count them. What then? The pleasure that he gives is full as great as if it cost a fortune. Uh, um, uh, uh, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I, uh, something, I think. No. I should like, like to be able to say a few words to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short. Quick, now this was not addressed to Scrooge, nor to anyone that he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again he saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of youth. He was not alone, but he sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little, she said softly to Scrooge's former self, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in time to come as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. You fear the world too much. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses them, have I not? Well, what if I have grown so much wiser? I, I, I'm not changed toward you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement? In words? No, never. In what then? A changed nature, an altered spirit, another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I hope that you would choose a flowerless girl? And choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him that you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I cannot bear it. I told you these are the shadows of the things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, take me back, haunt me no longer. As he struggled with his spirit, he was conscious of being exhausted and further of being in his own room. He had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Uh, Scrooge awoke in his own room, but it and his ad own adjoining room into which he shuffled uh, in a, and had it undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that petrifaction of a hearth had not known in Scrooge's time, nor in Marley's, nor for many and many a winter season's past. Heaped upon the floor to form a sort of throne were turkeys, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, immense twelfth cakes, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state upon this throne sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a torch in his hand in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it high above his head to shed its rays on Scrooge as he came peeping around the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me, you've never seen the like of me before. No, never. Never walk forth in these later years with my elder brothers, meaning for I am very young, my younger brothers born in these later years. I don't think I have, Spirit. Have you had many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. <coughs> Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson that's working now. Tonight, if you have aught to tell me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. 
Scrooge did as he would bid, and the room and its contents vanished instantly. And they stood in the busy thoroughfares of a great city upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on invisible straight to Scrooge's clerks. And the th on the threshold of the door, the spirit stopped and smiled to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling. Think of that. Bob had but 15 bob a week. He pocketed on Saturdays but 15 copies of his Christian name. And yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then uprose Mrs. Cratchit, Bob's wife, dressed out but poorly and poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave and ribbons that are cheap and make a show for sixpence, and laid the sloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, while Master Peter plunged the fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth. He rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now the two young Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onions these two young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew at the slow fire until the potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the, pan, at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got your father and, and the tiny Tim and Martha she warmed so late last year by half an hour? Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother. Hurrah, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. Well, we did a deal of work to finish up this morning, the last night, mother, and I had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind, my dear, so long as you're here. Give me your shawl and bonnet, and, and sit you down before the fire, and have a warm, Lord bless you. No, hide, Martha, hide. Here's father coming, so Martha hid as she was bid. And in came little Bob with at least three feet of his comforter dangling below his waistcoat and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming on Christmas Day? Ma Martha couldn't bear to see him disappointed, if only in a joke, and she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house to hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did tiny Tim behave? Oh, as good as gold and better too. Some way he gets thoughtful sitting by himself and thinks the strangest things. He told me today that he hoped the people saw him in church because it might be pleasant for them to remember who made the blind to see on Christmas Day and the lame to walk. His active little crutch was heard on the stairs and back came tiny Tim before another word could be spoken, escorted by his brother and his sister to his place beside the fire while Bob, turning up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, concocted some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer, while Master Peter Cratchit and the two young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, hissing hot, ready beforehand in a saucepan on the back of the stove. Miss Belinda sweetened the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Bob took Tiny Tim beside himself at a little corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everyone, not forgetting themselves. 
and mounting guard upon their stools, they crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. Well, when the, at last the dishes were all put on and grace was said, this was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, running her eye along the knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board and even tiny Tim excited by the two young Cratchits, beat upon the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! 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 Oh, there never was such a goose. <laughs> its tenderness, flavor, size, and cheapness <laughs> were the themes of universal admiration eked out by mashed potatoes and applesauce. It was a sufficient meal for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit proudly said, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the plate, they hadn't eaten it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the two young Cratchits were steeped in sage and onions to the eyebrows. But now, the cloth being cleared by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose someone should have gotten over the backyard fence and stolen it while they were making merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. <laughs> All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, great deal of steam. Pudding was out of the copper. Smell like a washing day. Oh, that is the cloth. A smell like an eating house with the laundresses next door to that and a pastry cooks next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half, of, half a quartern of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, wonderful pudding. Bob said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. <coughs> Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind. She would confess that she'd had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it. But nobody said or even suggested it was at all a small pudding for so large a family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. But now, cloth being cleared by Miss Belinda, uh, apples and oranges were placed on the table, shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. And then all the family drew round in what Bob Cratchit called the family dis uh, circle. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass. Two tumblers and a custard cup without any handle. This held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks. Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, everyone, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child, but then dreaded that he might be taken from him. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, well, I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. I'm sure I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, Christmas Day, the children. Well, it should be Christmas Day indeed when one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, 
unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert, no better knows, knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day, the children. Well, I'll drink his health for your sake and for the children's, but not for his. <laughs> Long life to him. Merry Christmas and a very happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I've no doubt. The children drank the toast after her, but was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mere mention of their name cast a gloom upon them that was not dispel its dispelled for fully five minutes. When it was gone, they were twice as merry as before from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baneful being done with. Then Bob told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter being a man of business, while Master Peter looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if contemplating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. And Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, told them how many hours she had to work a day and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow for a good long rest, tomorrow being a day that she spent at home. And how she had seen a countess and a lord a few days before, and the lord was much about as tall as Peter. At which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen the top of his head if you'd been there. And all this time, the chestnuts and the jug went round and round. And by and by, they had a song from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. Now, there was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. Master Peter might have known, very likely did, the inside of a pawn shop, but they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with their lot. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially upon Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, as this scene vanished, to hear a hearty laugh. A much greater surprise to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, uh, with the spirit standing by his side, looking at his nephew. Now it is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, but while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in this world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed out lustily. Their assembled friends, being not a whit behindhand, laughed out merrily. Why, he said that Christmas was a humbug, and believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was. All sorts of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes that you ever saw in a little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would call uh, provoking, but, uh, oh, satisfactory, too. Perfectly satisfactory. Well, he's a comical old fellow and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment. I'm sure I have nothing to say against him. Here he takes it into his head not to come and dine with us today. Well, what's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner. Everyone else said the same thing. And they must be allowed to have been judges, for they had just finished dinner. And with the dessert upon the table, they were seated about the lamplight by firelight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, but I haven't much faith myself in these young uh, housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? No, Topper. Topper clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on such a subject. 
where at Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. <laughs> After dinner, they had some music. Well, they were a musical family and knew what they were about as when they sang a glee or a catch, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one without swelling the large veins in his forehead or getting red in the face over it. But he didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits. For it's good to be children sometimes, never better than at Christmas time when its mighty founder was a child himself. There was first a game at Blind Man's Buff, but I no more believe that Topper was really blinded than I believe he had eyes in his boots for the way he took after that plump sister in the laced Tucker <laughs> was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, <laughs> tumbling over the fire iron bumping up against the piano, smothering himself in the lace curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He wouldn't catch anyone else. If indeed you'd fallen up against him, if some of them did, he would have made an effort at trying to catch you, which would have been an affront upon your understanding and instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Here's a new game, spirit. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, in which Scrooge's nephew had to think of some object, the rest to find out what. He only answered to their questions by yes or no, as the case might be. The fire of questions to which he was exposed elicited from him the fact that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather a disagreeable animal, an animal that uh, lived in London and walked about the streets and uh, was not, not made a show of. It was not a horse, an ass, a cow, a bull, a tiger, a dog, a pig, a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question to put to him, the nephew, nephew became so inexpressibly tickled that he had to finally get up off the sofa and stamp. <laughs> I know what it is. It's your Uncle Scrooge which indeed it was. <laughs> Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to the question, is it a bear, <laughs> should have been yes. <laughs> Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay, gay that he would have drank to this unconscious company in an inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew, and he and the ghost were again upon their journeys. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home by poverty, and it was rich in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in miseries every haunt where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred his spirit out, he left his teachings and gave Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the clock struck twelve. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, he beheld a phantom draped and hooded coming like a mist along the ground toward him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached, and when it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which it passed, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter that I've seen, but as I hope to, to live to be another man from what I was, I'm prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Gave him no response. The hand was pointed straight before him. Lead on, spirit, lead on. It's 
Precious time to me, I know, the night is waning fast. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seem to enter the city. The city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were, on change amongst the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little map of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointed toward them. Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, I don't know very much about it either way. I only know that he's dead. Well, when did he die? I, I thought he'd never die. Oh, last night, I believe. What did he die of? Oh, I don't know. What's he done with all his money? Well, he hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. Bye-bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the ghost should attach importance to a conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling assured it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past. And this ghost province was in the future. He looked about him in this very place for his own image. But though clock pointed the usual time of day for his being there, he saw no likeness of himself amongst the crowds that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he'd been contemplating in his heart a change of scene. Uh, they left this, uh, the, this busy place and went into an obscure part of town to a little shop where iron, rags, bones, bottles, and greasy offal were bought and sold. A gray-haired rascal of great age sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the ghost came into the presence of this man just as a woman with a heavy bundle came in. She was closely followed by another woman similarly laden, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a period of blank astonishment in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a hearty laugh. Well, let the charwoman alone to be the first, and the laundress alone to be the second, and the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it. Well, you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to sell? What have you got to sell? Half a minute's patience, Joe, and you shall see. What odds then, Mrs. Dilber? What odds? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed, ma'am. No, indeed. If he wanted to keep me after he was dead, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd had someone to take care of him when he was struck with death, instead of gasping out his last alone by himself. It's the truest words that was ever spoke. It's a judgment on him. Well, it would have been a good deal heavier judgment, you can depend upon it, if I could have set my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and speak out plain. I'm not ashamed for, to be the first, nor ashamed for them to see me. Old Joe went down on his knees for the great convenience of opening the bundle and dragged out some heavy rolls of dark stuff. What's this? Bed curtains? Aye, bed curtains. Don't drop that oil on them blankets now. His blankets? Who else do you suppose? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. Ah, you may look that shirt through till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole nor a threadbare place in it. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see, I see, the case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven! What's this? The scene had changed. Now they almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon it. And on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, lay the body of this plundered unknown man. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death of this dark chamber will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him to Bob Pratchett's dwelling, the one he had visited before. He found the mother and the children seated about the fire, but surely they were very quiet. 
Uh, the little Cratchits were quiet and, and sat in one corner, look at, looking up at Peter, who had a book in his hand. And he took a child and placed him in the midst of them. Where did Scrooge heard those words? Well, he couldn't have dreamed them. Well, the boy must have read them when he came across the threshold. Why didn't he go on? The mother laid down her work on the table. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color? Ah, poor tiny Tim. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes for the world. It must be near his time of coming, past it rather. But I think he's walked a little slower of late than usual, mother. Well, I've known him walk with tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, and so have I, and so had all. Yes, but he was very light, and his father loved him so that was no trouble. Ah, here's your father now. She hurried out to meet him. Little Bob came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob. Each one tried to see who could help him to it most. The little Cratchits climbed each child upon his knee and laid each child a cheek against his face. And though they said, don't mind it, uh, Father, don't be grieved. Bob was very pleasant. He looked at the work of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls and praised their industry and speed. They'd be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday, you, you, you went today then, Bob? Yes, my dear, I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. I promised him that I'd walk there of a Sunday. My little child, my little child. He broke down all at once. He, he couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. Spirit, something tells me that our parting is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was that we saw with a covered face, lying dead. The ghost conducted him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard, stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw near to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be? Or are they the shadows of the things that may be only? Still the hand was immovable. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say that is thus with what you show me. Still the hand was immovable, and Scrooge, creeping toward the stone and following his, for his forefinger, he read the, read the name upon the neglected grave, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I the man that lay upon that bed? No, no, spirit, I'll not be the man that I was. I'll not be the man that I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me these things if I'm past all hope? For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I'll keep Christmas in my heart and honor it all the year. The spirits of the past, the present, and the future shall strive within me. Oh, tell me that I may yet sponge away the writings on this stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in a phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time was his own to make amends in. Running to his window, he put it up and stuck out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today, my fine fellow? Paul screwed downward to a boy in his Sunday clothes, who perchance had loitered to look about him. Eh? What's today?
Today, why it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. <laughs> I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. <laughs> Say, uh, do you know? Uh, do you know the poulterers in the next street, but one at the corner? I should say I did. <laughs> what a delightful boy. Why, it's a pleasure to talk to him. Say, do you know whether they sold the, uh, the prize turkey yet? Not the little prize turkey. The big one. The one as big as me? Yes, me buck. Why, it's hanging there? Is it? Well, then go and buy it. No, 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 I'm in earnest. Go and buy it. Tell the man to come here that I may give him the directions where to send it. Come back with him and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. <laughs> I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as ending at the Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one. But right it he did, somehow and any hour went, went downstairs to open the door, ready for the coming of the poulter's man. Oh, it was a turkey, that bird. It never could have stood upon its legs. It would have snapped them square off in a minute like the sticks of sealing wax. But at last they were, he got himself dressed out all in his best and got out into the street. The people were by this time coming from, forth from the churches as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present and walking with his hands behind him. Scrooge surveyed everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly good-natured and good-humored the three or four pleasant fellows said, Good morning, sir. Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterward that of all the blithe sounds that he'd ever heard, those were the blithest. In the afternoon, he made his way toward his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But at last he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Well, where is he, my dear? Well, he's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. Well, you needn't tell him I'm here. I'll just go right in. He knows me. Why, bless my soul. Who's there? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? Why, it's a mercy he didn't shake his hand off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could have been heartier. His niece looked just the same when she came. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everybody when they came. Wonderful games, wonderful party, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. Oh, but he was early at the office next morning. He was early there. If he could only be there first, and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That's what he'd set his heart on, and he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. Quarter past. No Bob. Bob was full 18 and a half minutes behind his time. His cap was off before he'd opened the door. He was on his stool in an instant, driving away with his pen as if he was striving to overtake nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Called Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? <laughs> well, I'm 
Very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. Yes, yes, you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry, sir, but uh, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. It, uh, it shall not be repeated, I assure you. Now look here, sir. <coughs> I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. <coughs> therefore, <coughs> therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. <laughs> Bob trembled. Got a little nearer to the roller. I raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family and we'll discuss your affairs this uh, very afternoon over a smoking bowl of Christmas Bishop Bob. Bob, make up the fire. Buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father. He was as good a friend, as good a man, as good a master, as this good old city, as there any other city, town, or borough in this good old world ever knew. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence plan forever after. <laughs> and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed that knowledge. May that be said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. One of those who uh, was here in 1908, I have a confession to make, which I think I should have done long ago, but at the ripe age of 15, I had a great deal of difficulty telling which of Dr. Lean's repertoire was my favorite, the Christmas Carol or O'Grady's Goat. <laughs> On behalf of the Board of Trustees, both officially and personally, I would like to express the great service that Dr. Lean has rendered to this colony and this community over these 51 years that he has been here and giving this Christmas carol. I don't think we can say enough in that direction. So I will close with the words of a famous author, God bless us everyone and particularly Dr. and Mrs. Lean. one other part of this program. May I make this announcement first, that as we leave the chapel tonight, the students will receive candles that will be burned on the quadrangle during the carol singing. I am asked to announce that there is a hope on the part of the people who have arranged the candles that some of you may see fit to burn these same candles or the rest of them in your own homes on Christmas Eve. I'll make one promise. One candle will be lit on the quadrangle at 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve. The rain not falling. <laughs> there are other things on the campus that you will learn in due course tonight. Now it's my pleasure to present the man who succeeded, Dr. Lean, 
as chairman of the Department of Speech, and he will conclude the evening's program. Thank you, and Merry Christmas to you all. Dr. and Mrs. Lean, the group that you see before you here tonight represents about one-third of the people who tried to get into this room tonight. Not only are there people in this auditorium here, but there are many other people waiting to see you out on the quadrangle in a few moments. Another large group is gathered over in Taylor Hall, where they have been listening to these proceedings over the public address system, and many, many people throughout the community and the county have been hearing what has been going on here tonight through the good offices of WCW in remote control from WWST-FM. This room, with every available seat occupied, is a crowded place. But the cubic footage of this room, or of any other room of which I have any knowledge, could not hold tonight all of the good wishes, the expressions of gratitude and love and affection for Dr. and Mrs. Lincoln. Literally around the world, people are thinking about what has been going on here tonight. Former students who look back with admiration and gratitude and love. Now I'm holding a large volume in my hand, Dr. and Mrs. Lane. This is not a Manhattan telephone directory. <laughs> this was not written by Wally Seagap. <laughs> this is an unique volume. It is the only one of its kind in the world. And this volume has nearly 500 authors. For in this volume are letters which have come to this campus in recent days. Also, you will find the sheaf of telegrams in the front that have arrived today. Telegrams of gratitude and good wishes to you on the occasion of this golden anniversary of the reading of this carol. You have read this carol on this particular evening in the school year for more than half of the life of this college. And, sir, we look forward to the next 50 years of the reading of the carol. Thank you, Dr. and Mrs. Lean, and Merry, Merry Christmas to you who have given so much merriment to us throughout the years. certain observations that I made, but not from anything that I heard or knew anything, really knew anything about. Well, my dear friends, this is an emotional experience for me and for Mrs. Lean. There are three occasions that stand out in my mind as most beautiful occasions on which I gave the Christmas carol. The first was about uh, 10 years ago. Oh, much, a little more than that, I guess. 13 or 14 years, maybe. But anyway, <clears throat> on that occasion, uh, I had, was retired and uh, was giving it for the last time as a regular member of the faculty. And there came up from downtown some businessmen. Ralph Fisher was the mayor of the city at that time. They presented me with a beautiful watch. Dr. Lowry said they had a Christmas cake to give me also. 
and we should get outside as soon as possible to see it. Well, there was a lighted candle in every window that faces the quadrangle. And when we got out there, the ground was covered with a white snow. The students were singing carols. The Christmas tree was ablaze with lights. And Mrs. Lean and I stood out at the side here and we looked at the full moon that was coming up right over that Christmas tree. And I thought that was the most beautiful sight that we had ever seen. And we went home, you can imagine, rather thoughtfully. But it was lovely. Last year, <coughs> when I gave the Christmas carol here, the arrangement was made so that the students carried lighted candles all around the quadrangle. And again, the tree was lit. And again, the students were all singing a song. And when I went out the door, they moved in toward me and I found myself in the center of the lights. And I thought to myself, well, maybe that's Sir Pete. The moon, yes, I forgot about the moon. The moon was up that time, too. <laughs> and by the moon, by the way, the moon would be here tonight if it were not for the fact that it's a cloudy night. I saw that last night, and I hoped it would be, it would be clear tonight. And then came tonight. And I thought, I thought that was fine. That was beautiful. I thought, well, that surpasses the first the uh, scene that I told you about. Well, tonight, <clears throat> surrounded by friends, former friends and students, old debaters, old friends with whom I've traveled across the country, and orators and all sorts of people of that sort, and with the people of the city of Worcester, why, this, I'm sure, is the best of all three. For there isn't anything that really, no, no words can express the feeling of Mrs. Lean and me at this time. And we just merely I'd like to pick out, I don't dare start on it, pick out this one here and there, and the work that has been done. I know what these fellows have done all right. This doesn't happen by accident. I know what they've been, up, been up to now. <laughs> but six weeks ago, Bill Craig said to me, he said, now I'll tell you that we're going to have a good time and I shall not answer a single question from now on. <laughs> and I took him at his word, and I didn't ask him any questions. But I had no idea you were going to get into this sort of thing, Mr. Craig. So the only thing that I can say to you is that we are surrounded by our friends. It's the most delightful and beautiful experience in the world. And when you youngsters and that means a lot of you gray-haired people, too. <laughs> when you youngsters get to the age that uh, I am, you'll realize that friends, after all, is said and done. That friends and friendship mean more to you than anything else in the world. And so we want to wish you a Merry Christmas, but I'm going to close this thing now I'm going to ask the audience to say something with me. You all know the line, God bless us everyone. I'm going to ask you to say that. I'll say everything else but that. And when I say God bless us, you'll make a pause and think, and then you'll say afterward, every one. 
Now let's just try it. Oh, there's one change I'm going to make. I'm going, instead of putting my hands this way, I'm going to put my hands this way. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Amen. Thank you very much.